I welcome members to this sixth meeting in 2005 of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee and remind everyone to switch off mobile phones as they affect the broadcasting system. Um, item one uh, is for the committee to agree to take agenda item seven in private. This item is the consideration of a complaint. Do members agree to take this item in private? Yes, we're agreed. Item two is for the committee to decide whether to take the following items in private. Uh, future consideration of the report of the commissioner and its own draft report on the complaint in private at a future meeting. Uh, <clears throat> and in relation to its inquiry into the election of committee conveners, whether its consideration of oral evidence heard, including at uh, agenda item six, uh, issues for draft report and draft report should be taken in private at future meetings. Are we agreed? Yes. We're agreed. Thank you very much. Uh, the third item, <coughs> third item of business is uh, for committee to take evidence from Bruce Crawford, MSP, on the proposed cross-party group on tourism. Unfortunately, Bruce Crawford's unable to attend this morning due to illness, and this item is therefore deferred in the evidence session uh, which I think will be relatively brief, uh, has been rescheduled for our meeting next week. Right, we now come to agenda item four, uh, which is the first evidence session uh, related to our inquiry into the election of committee conveners. Uh, in attendance today, we have Dr. Hannah White, the Institute of Government Programme Director. We have uh, Professor James Mitchell, Co-Director of the Academy of Government, uh, and Professor Charlie uh, Jeffrey, Senior Vice Principal, both of whom are from the University of Ev Edinburgh. Uh, may I welcome all our witnesses to and thank you uh, for, for helping us there. Um, we'll go straight to questions, if I may. My, my practice is that uh, I will, at the end, uh, give you the opportunity, if you think there are gaps in our questioning and things that we, we should hear, are, are limited, roughly 100 word. Um, the, to, to, to perhaps uh, inform us where we, we, we haven't managed to do that for ourselves. Right, members have a series of questions and of course the answers may inform further questions, so we'll see where that takes us. Uh, Margaret. Thank you, convener, and good morning, panel. Um, would elected conveners enhance power sharing and accountability between members, the Parliament, the Scottish Government and the Scottish people? Well, I think the reason you've asked me here today to talk to you is um, because I've been doing a piece of research recently on the way that um, the elections of select committee chairs in, in Westminster have been, has been working out for the last, for the last parliament. Um, so what I can mostly talk to you about is, is what I've learned from my research about, about the impact that that, that has had. Um, and what I would say is, is there is certainly a symbolic value um, in increasing the, the democratic um, nature of the way in which um, committee chairs in Westminster are appointed. Um, there's been a, a definite impact on the way in which um, select committee chairs view themselves um, and the legitimacy and the credibility they feel they have having been elected by their peers. Um, and in, in the sense that um, there's then that direct line of accountability that the people elect the parliament and the parliament is then responsible for electing uh, the people who will conduct scrutiny within the legislature of the executive, I think you could argue that that, that will in, would enhance, enhance the situation. Uh, I, your, your question, I think, is whether uh, the, some of the founding principles of the parliament would be enhanced uh, by this kind of change. Uh, and I guess that's a question about whether those founding principles are being borne out in the way uh, that we might have uh, expected, uh, given the, uh, the, the, the sense of, of ambition uh, and renewal that accompanied the foundation of the parliament. Uh, and I think it's a good, a good time, um, a decade and a half and a bit more in to be thinking about that. Uh, and I think there is... Uh, I think it would probably be fair to say a view among academics who look at the parliament that uh, the parliament is not fully matching up to those founding principles. Uh, and the work of the committees is one of the areas where it may uh, indeed be uh, falling short. 
Uh, and I think that's uh, a good reason for, for thinking about uh, this and perhaps other kinds of reform, uh, to see if, if some of those founding uh, ideas can be better realised than, uh, than they have been. Uh, and I think there are two ways in which that might be. Um, I think what experience in the House of Commons has shown is um, that it may not be the best idea to allow the government in the form of the majority constellation in a parliament to pick some of the people who scrutinise it uh, through um, party discipline and whipping uh, measures. Um, and I think there's that, 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 that argument could be transferred quite easily to uh, the Scottish Parliament context. There may be a, a point about the, the opposition as well, because there, there may be a sense that the opposition is not necessarily always using uh, the structures of the Parliament uh, as it might do uh, to do its job uh, of scrutinising government. And perhaps uh, elected uh, conveners, um, some of whom would be provided by opposition parties, may be a way of enhancing that uh, scrutiny function to the general benefit of Parliament and those it represents in holding government to account. Um, I think if we go back to the Constitutional Convention and the debates leading up to the Parliament and the expectations, I think there was no doubt that there was an expectation and a hope that there would be a greater sharing of power than has been realised. Now, I think in part some of the expectations were unrealistic to start with, um, idealistic, um, unrealistic, choose whichever term you wish, but I think that was part of the problem. Um, and I think we, we haven't realised the, the, those high ideals. Um, and I think if we were to try to move towards those ideals, um, then I think we would be looking for some kind of reforms. And it's conceivable that amongst the, 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 the reforms that could be considered would be um, election of, of conveners. I wouldn't want to suggest that that is a panacea that will solve everything. I think there's a danger of assuming that, um, but it could contribute to that. And I think one of the things that, in looking at the evidence on this from other countries, the evidence is, basis is relatively weak. Um, that's not to say that there isn't a strong case for this. It's just that this has not been tried out very often. Um, House of Commons, I think, is the obvious place to look for um, evidence for, for this parliament to, to draw upon. Um, um, and, and we've heard, I mean, there is some evidence symbolically um, that it's important, but I think anyone who imagines that such a change would uh, dramatically change the balance of power, I think would be, we'd, we'd be mistaken. That's not to, to say it's not a good idea, um, but I think we have to, to be realistic in a way that perhaps we weren't in the early days of devolution. Um, right. Thank you for that. I mean, Professor Jeffrey, you touched on my second question, which is around uh, would it enhance the scrutiny, mm -hmm. and perhaps uh, Dr. Hannah White and uh, Professor Mitchell could uh, give their view on that. Um, I mean, I take on board what you've said up till now, and obviously um, what we're talking about today is <coughs> the election of conveners, but you know, does that then mean you know you should elect the members of the committees as well? So, you know, it opens a, a can of worms, doesn't it? <laughs> but um, so, so, if you could perhaps uh, just widen your answer on that. Sure. Well, I mean that that is that is an obvious next question, I guess. And and Westminster did obviously choose to open that can all in one go. Um, so, in some ways. It's, it's difficult to disaggregate the impact of electing chairs from ele electing the whole committee, which is what happened at the start of the Parliament. Um, I, mean, I think you could probably say that approximately a fifth to a quarter of, of the chairs who are now chairs in Westminster would not have been chairs under the old system. Um, and that's particularly visible in the two by-elections we've had since the start of the Parliament. So we've had a by-election for the Health Committee and for the Defence Committee. And both the candidates who ended up being elected to those committees are, are candidates who would never have been chairs under, under the old system. They were first-term members, um, and they were regarded in, in some respects as, as, as a little bit maverick in their, in their parties. They weren't the obvious candidate. They weren't the result that the, that the whips expected. Um, they both, and I mean this is a sample of two, so it's not in any sense scientific, but it's interesting. They both brought and um, 
may have been elected, again, um, this is supposition, but may have been elected by their peers, partly because they brought some previous experience of the subject matter of the committee that they were going on to, and they had clear ideas about the um, sort of the policy questions that they wanted to look at when they went in, their, in their manifestos when they spoke about that. So um, I think you can say, and also looking more broadly at the chairs who were elected at the start of the parliament, that... Um, Slightly different people, some slightly different people have, have been elected chairs and that, that, has, that has had an impact on scrutiny because some of the people who've been elected chairs, and then I'm, I'm thinking again here of Andrew Tyree who was elected chair of the Treasury Committee slightly unexpectedly at the start of the Parliament, have been people who have pushed the boundaries of the powers and practices of committees a little further than than, the, than had been the case in the past. So I think the fact that these chairs have felt that they've had the legitimacy of having been elected by their peers, and this is, this is what they have told me, um, has meant that they've felt that they've got that mandate to try a few different things. And, of course, in, in Andrew Tyree's case, we had the example of the Parliamentary Commission on Banking Standards, which, in which he deliberately tried to be innovative and try some new things in terms of scrutiny. Um, so I think we can definitely see that that there has been that impact from, from, those, from the introduction of, of the election of, of chairs on, on scrutiny? Um, again, the evidence in this is, is, is not strong. That's, again, not to say that's um, possible. But I guess if we work on the assumption that an elected chair has a source of authority and legitimacy that would otherwise be absent, then it is conceivable that that would... Um, bring a leadership, a different type of leadership to a committee um, and the, the, a more independent leadership. Now that's not to say that this I'm certainly not criticising the current or any other committee convener, but I, I, in as much as uh, the authority that may lie behind it gives him or her um, a, an independence that, that could be a useful source whether it's for scrutiny or any other business. But again I want to have to stress there are some ifs, buts, maybes in that. I think, and the evidence, again, is, is not strong on this. We, we, I think we do have to draw on the experience of the House of Commons, and it's still early days. But, if you like, the theory behind doing this makes sense. The authority, the legitimacy, based on election, we should expect would lead to a different type of approach, or might lead to a different type of approach. Again, I, I don't want to overstate my case. I'm and, of course, just to add to that, it does remain to be seen what the activities in chairs in this parliament does to their chances of being re-elected chairs in the next parliament. Could I make an extra comment about the evidence base? Um, uh, and I, w I agree with James that the evidence base is, is slight. There aren't many examples to draw on. And it was striking in the, in the SPICE document um, that accompanied this inquiry um, that what's happening in the House of Commons appears to be pretty much uh, unique. Um, but I do think that reflects the particular style of operation of the House of Commons, which is um, highly adversarial, uh, with very strong uh, party discipline, uh, and the, 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 the notion of the, the, the sovereign parliament playing into that as well. And, and that, that perhaps does suggest a context in which you need to do something to balance the parliament against the executive a little bit more. Um, we should also in that context though, though note that this parliament is a parliament which is in many respects within the Westminster tradition. Despite the, 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 the attempts in the framing of what the parliament should be and how it should work, in practice it has replicated many of the features uh, of the Westminster system with a strong adversarial uh, element and pretty strong party discipline uh, as well. Uh, and those, those shared features with the Westminster Parliament uh, may make uh, what's happening in the Westminster Parliament a good example to look at, even if there aren't many other examples. Uh, let me bring some others in on the subject. First, Dave Thompson. Uh, thank you very much, convener. Good morning uh, to the panel. Um, it was just to kind of follow on uh, that, that kind of general point, and it was a comment that uh, Professor Mitchell made, actually, in terms of the reforms, that um, there are maybe other things I think you were hinting at that need to be done, that, that this on its own, um, you know, might achieve something. But is it your view that to make it really effective and to get the sort of scrutiny that you uh, might think is appropriate, 
that this would need to be done in conjunction with other matters, such as, for instance, I'm thinking one of the big problems we have in this parliament, we have a limited number of MSPs. Um, a big chunk of them are in government or their main opposition spokespersons, so they're taken out of the equation. We've way under 100 MSPs to service all our committees, all our cross-party groups and everything else. So time to scrutinise is very important. We have a system of debates where we have six-minute and four-minute debates, which means that sometimes our party at the moment needs to get nine speakers in a debate in an afternoon, which ties up nine people for that single debate. Do you feel that it needs to be looked at in a broader sense if it's really going to be effective, um, or do you actually think that this point on its own would be sufficient to initiate further change down the line? I'll just start the last point. I don't think this alone would be sufficient. Um, that's the easy part. I think it's much more difficult to outline what needs to be done. And, I mean, I think from what you were saying, I mean, I, one could draw the conclusion, and it's a conclusion I have already drawn, that the size of the parliament is an impediment in many respects. However, I don't see any appetite for increasing the size of the parliament, certainly not at this juncture in time. Um, I think there are issues around the size, the, the number of committees... Um, perhaps the resourcing of committees needs to be looked at. Again, I, we've got to take into account the current environment. Um, the resources are scarce. Um, and I suppose one could conclude that uh, this is as good as it gets in the current climate. Um, but I do think it would be well worth looking at reform um, in the overall. I think it is, um, it's worth considering... Um, you know, the relationship between uh, the chamber and the uh, committees, I think the number of committees, the <coughs> subjects that are looked at. Um, yeah, I mean, I think all of these things, but I'm not, going here to, I, I'm not going to try and give a prescription because, frankly, I think it would require a lot more work. Um, but I do think, it, it, you know, anyone who thinks that the election of conveners is going to dramatically change things, I think that's unlikely, to put it mildly. Can I maybe just follow up briefly then? Um, and maybe the other panellists might want to comment as well. In that case, would we be better advised to look more broadly, take more time, and, and look at a bigger package of changes over a longer period? Maybe, you know, it might even need to run into the next parliament. Um, rather than go ahead on one, what I think you're saying is a relatively small sort of piecemeal change, or do you think we should drive ahead with this one anyway, or is it better done in the round in a broader sense? Let me give my thought on that, and I think that the, these are not either ors. I think you could do both. I think you could go ahead with this, but then take this further into and look at this in, in the round. That would be my suggestion. And I guess the point on that is if you went ahead with this now, it, it might be reasonable to suppose that those who then stood to be conveners of committees would be those members self-selecting who had more of an interest in the committee system and how to make it work to best effect. And then the role of the committee of conveners might be enhanced in, in, pushing, in looking at the other options for, for improving things. So it might be a useful interim step. Could I add a comment? Um, I'm not sure it would be a small and piecemeal change. I think it would be a significant change to the to the culture of operation of the of, of the Parliament. Um, um, having said that, uh, I, I have um, quite a lot of sympathy for the wider point you make, um, and I have even more sympathy for that when you project forward, because in some way or other, as yet to be entirely determined, this Parliament is going to have more to do. Uh, and it's going to have matters of, uh, of particular complexity uh, around uh, fiscal policy and around welfare policy to add to its uh, list of tasks. Uh, and I do think that puts the, the, the capacity point that you made into perspective and suggests the need beyond thinking about conveners, which could be done separately, but beyond that, uh, of thinking in a much more systematic way about how this parliament remains fit for purpose as it moves forward. 
Thanks, uh, Kentina. You've got some points yes. on this, and if you would move so into what you're going to my ask. questions, I thought. Yes, uh, yes, Dr White said that um, the conveners were elected by first-term first -term members. Do you see that as a disadvantage or, or an advantage? I didn't quite get your... I, um, what did you think? Uh, I, was, I was merely noting that it was a, a change, yeah. so that something that the new system facilitated. I mean, I would tend to think that any member elected to a parliament should have an equal chance of mm -hmm. standing for any of the jobs in parliament, and it, and it shouldn't necessarily be a question that, you know, the longer your experience, which was certainly used to be the case in Westminster, that the people who were parachuted in or, you know, chosen by the whips tended to be members of longer experience, I think members with outside experience can bring useful things to the committee system. So I think it's a good thing that, that any member of the parliament could potentially stand and be elected as, as, as a chairman. Okay. Can, I, can I put an observation on that? I, mean, I think the other side of it, the evidence from the states, we are in the past, not currently, um, Commission convenience where essentially chairs were, were, were appointed, uh, depending on how long they've been uh, elected, proved to be not a good policy, and that was changed. So the opposite, in other words, um, uh, appointment in terms of how long you've been a member was not a very good system that operated for, for decades in the United States in Congress. So that, that changed dramatically, and it improved the, the, the system. So that, looking at it from the opposite angle, as it were. I think, I think there's a saying, have you five years' experience or one year's five times? <laughs> and I think that probably kind of covers it. It's probably the nature of people's experience rather than the duration that we should be thinking about. Cameron. Also, do you think, thank you very much, do you think that there are differences in the Scottish Parliament that elected conveners uh, wouldn't have the same effect in the House of Commons as they have here, or as, here as they have in the House of Commons, because we're a smaller Parliament? That's what I was really trying to get at as well. Yes, you're a smaller Parliament. I mean, I, I must defer to my... Um, learned colleagues who have much better, better understanding and knowledge of the Scottish Parliament than I do. But um, I think that the, there, is a smaller, uh, there is a smaller pool, <laughs> obviously, of, of, of members to choose from. Um, it is a younger Parliament, so whereas in um, Westminster there is probably a greater variety of members who have been... Um, perhaps exhausted their um, possibilities for, for ministerial office or expectations of ministerial office but, or, or um, are seen as sort of senior backbenchers with experience who might um, be available and wish to stand as chairs alongside, as I've said, the, the, the first-term members who might want to come in. That, that is necessarily less the case for, for the Scottish Parliament because it hasn't been in existence for as long. So there were, there were differences, obviously, but um, I don't think that the differences preclude the, the change being a beneficial one. So, because I, I read in the briefing paper that some people were very happy to be elected conveners. That's as far as they really wanted to go. It was a summit of their sort of uh, achievement. I think that was certainly the intention behind um, Tony, the rights that Tony... Yeah. The, the reforms that Tony Wright proposed was that people could see being a member and chair of a committee as a, as a career path in itself and, and a, as a backbench career. And, of course, that is assisted in the Westminster context by the fact that committee chairs are paid. Um, mm. the, um, but from the interviews that I've carried out for my research, I would say that although being a committee chair is seen as a... As a um, prestigious thing to do and as a thing which gives you, many people would argue, more power and influence than, well, certainly influence, not power, more mm. <laughs> influence than lots of um, junior um, ministerial jobs, which you might have. Um, certainly that's a point that Chris Mullen made in his diaries, that he would rather be <laughs> chair of the Home Affairs Committee than, than a minor, a minor um, minister. Um, even though that is the case, it, it still seems to be that most members would still give up a committee chair for the lure of, of the front bench. Um, and I really didn't have anyone argue to me that, um, except, I mean, you could perhaps look at the example of Tony Wright, who was a politics professor and then came in, into Parliament and wanted, you know, had a lot of ideas about things that he would like to, to see done and, and, and had the opportunity of going on the Public Administration Select Committee to, to explore those ideas. There were very few members who... who who, who's, who still, I think, see it as, as a preferable route to potential of ministerial office. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I saw you. that as a converse question. 
is there any chance these folk would ever get into government in the first place? And that's why they would likely choose to be a, a, a chair. Do you, do you think many members who are elected think there's no chance that they're going to get into government? Well, I'm just trying to put my, <laughs> my, my, myself in their frame of mind. If mm. they, they thought there's no chance because they're maybe I, a little bit bullshy and, you know, they may think, well, you know, I'm, I'm an independent person in mind, so the government and the whips won't put me in. As I'm yeah. not an element of that, good job getting in to be a convener. Certainly, and throw certainly. Muscle about. And that would, and and this sort of system would would make that much more of a possibility. Hmm. I'm not sure if you were thinking of that as uh, as a as a recommendation or not. <laughs> um, but it but it does suggest to me that um, if one can find a place for the the, the talented. Uh, expert in a particular field who feels less comfortable than others with the strictures of party discipline, uh, then um, this route is, is, a, is, a, is a good one. Uh, and it may well be a, a, a good one for this parliament as it, as it matures, as it gets older, um, whereby th there, there will be a stock of people, perhaps bigger than now, the convener is, is one of them who have been uh, a minister, uh, and are unlikely to figure in a in a future government because oh, governments dear. and parties <laughs> <laughs> governments and parties like to like to renew themselves. I wasn't talking about specific people. Um, and and th this this may well be an alternative uh, way of using that accumulated uh, expertise. And I think we see that in in some of the uh, the, co uh, the the committee chairs uh, in Westminster or some who were just uh, a little bit too spiky for the, the party, but very, very talented, Andrew Tyree is, is, is one, uh, who have found a, a, a platform f uh, which is, of, I think, general benefit for their particular set of skills. You, you, you've just handed the convener the black spot. <laughs> well, it, I, it, it, it may, maybe worth just, just, just the, the observation, and you'll need to read my biography in due course to get the full story. But when I, when I was invited to go along to Butte House in 2007, it never occurred to me he was being invited along to discuss being a minister because I'd never the faintest thought in my mind on the subject. But there we are. That's, that's for another, another day. Uh, George, do you want to pick up the baton? Yes, each session of uh, this parliament has uh, created a different political uh, situation. You know, every session has. And uh, the voting system, by its very uh, design, is probably... Uh, created that. Now, how would this system work with these many different kind of the political situations that we've found ourselves in? Um, if you have a, a, a process of, of election of chairs to a certain set of committees where there's an allocation key which determines how many um, committees a party will provide the convener for, um, then that system will work with different complexities of, of parliamentary makeup. Uh, it may mean you have a, a smaller or a greater number of parties providing uh, committee uh, conveners. I don't think the. Uh, Bear in mind we've had minority government, majority government, and before that we had the rainbow uh, kind of parliament as well. Uh, yeah, but I, th I think the, the, the point is in part to, to disconnect. Uh, the process of establishing uh, committee conveners from uh, the form of uh, from from the government, whichever form it uh, it takes, uh, and I think that applies in whichever constellation of parties uh, and minority or majority relationships that exist in Parliament. I don't see that that would uh, necessarily uh, complicate the operation of uh, of an election system. I, I, I wonder if what George may be seeking to get to is that, for example, in this committee, we have a party who has a, a, who has a single representative here, and if it happened to be that party that is allocated the convenership, if we're to elect among the Conservative members of this committee, we don't actually have a choice. So can one vote for who is going to be convener without opening up the issue of how you decide who's on a committee? I suspect is, is, is part of it because because if there's only one candidate who's already a member of the committee, it's not an election. I think I think that is is you know it's a mechanical question in other words rather than a political question. Of course, the way it works in 
Westminster at the moment is that the chairs to, put, to committees are elected first, yeah. um, and they're elected. So the um, De Hunt system is used to distribute. So mm -hmm. there's a to, to decide how many committees will be chaired by which party, <coughs> and then the um, party whips between them decide which party will get which committee, um, and then only members of that party are eligible to stand for election to that committee. But that is all sorted out before then members stand for election as members of the committee. Um, so there's the potential for a larger number of candidates from a minority party if, it was, if there was a Conservative chair allocated to this committee, for example. It wouldn't only be one member who was eligible because there would be other people potentially able to stand. I may have misunderstood the question, so apologies if I'm, I'm, I'm running off on the wrong track. But I mean, I don't think it matters what the composition of the government is. This is about the Parliament. And even if, for example, mid-term, the government was to change from, say, a coalition to minority, that should not affect the decisions on conveniorships or committees. I think the, the Parliament ought to be a Parliament in and of itself. Um, and I think if it was to to radically change its ways on, uh, simply because of the, the executive, then that wouldn't necessarily be a very healthy situation to be in. I don't think the executive should be calling the shots. It's the parliament that ought to be calling the shots. And so um, one would imagine that the committee conveners would be based on party support, level of party support and number of conveners, and, and chosen as, as, as Hannah's outlined. So I, I, I'm not convinced that the, the nature of the government, whether it's minority or coalition or majority uh, would or indeed should affect things. But I may have misunderstood you, so apologies. The up of the membership of the Parliament, mm. so uh, regardless, just take out the fact I mentioned government then, mm -hmm. take that out of the scenario, you've still got the political parties, you still have them the way they're standing, so how, how would it work with the, the various different combinations of uh, the makeup of members that we've had over the past, since 1999? I think there would be an issue at the margins. It says as a smaller parties. I mean, that that would have to be addressed. I mean, I think in 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 the, in the case of this parliament and certainly certain uh, periods when you've had a, not a large number of smaller units, there would always be an issue as to how many, if any, should be allocated to the smaller parties. That would need to be sorted out for sure. I, I take that point on board. I think that is an interesting uh, point. I don't think it's insurmountable, but I think you would need, certainly need to, to, to consider this. If, for example, you had um, a large number of members who were independents or two or three small groups of two or three MSPs, for example, that would be uh, an interesting scenario. And one would imagine that, 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 that rules would have to be, well, we would have to have rules in advance for such a scenario. But yeah, I take, I take your point. And there is a problem that has led to in, Westmin in the Westminster context where um, the system has ha retained some flexibility in order to accommodate smaller parties, which has led to some committees being expanded in size in order to give seats to, the, to, to small parties, um, which some people feel has made those, some, of those, some committees unwieldy. Um, and this plays back into the, to, to the issue which was raised earlier about you know, the capacity of the Parliament as a whole and the number of members available to, to sit on all these committees. Uh, Dave Thompson. Uh, thank you, Convener. Yeah, just a wee follow-on. Uh, in the last Parliament um, with the minority government, uh, the De Hont system allocated up the seats, but the SNP minority government, in order to um, secure general support from the Green Party, actually allocated a committee convenership to Patrick Harvey of the Greens. Um, so I think that would feed into, you know... Politics came into it at that point, and you know, do you think that it would be easy to write rules that would still allow politics to come into the equation when necessary? I think we'd have to accommodate politics, but I mean, it would, would creep in whether you like it or not. And I, I don't think it's a bad thing necessarily, um, but I, I, do, I do think there would have to be some element there. I mean, you could be overly prescriptive for sure. Um, I think at the start of each parliament, you would have to consider these matters um, but again I, I don't think these are insurmountable I mean I, uh, uh, but what, what we do, don't want to have I mean a sense is a situation in which government and, and it is not really just governments front benches 
control things. I think that's the, the essence of this idea is to give more power to the back benches rather than front benches. That's, that's essentially what we're about. Well, might I suggest that uh, in, a, in a few weeks we may well see an illustration of some of these issues because the composition of the House of Commons is likely to be uh, a little bit more diverse and complex than it has been. So you may get an example in action uh, to observe in the not too distant future. Uh, uh, Just run on to, to the next well, point. Well, if I may, David, I've got others who want to come in the back. <coughs> on that one. Oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, the other former minister in the committee, Patricia. <laughs> Vina. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm quite intrigued by this issue about how we would react to different scenarios within the Parliament. And I, I'm, I, I understand the point that's being made, but if I could just say the situation we have at the moment, for example, where there are five Liberal Democrats. Now, if, that were, if we were to have elected conveners, that party would then, and if we're saying that elected conveners are important and that there should be opportunities for all uh, uh, to avail themselves of that um, opportunity to, to exert some influence, if not power, it would then be very hard for a party of that kind of size, and that's not unique here, to both um, service, if you like, the issues it wanted to cover as a front bench and also to have uh, members who were elected conveners. Because I get the impression, I don't know, um, Dr White will know better than, than, than I, that the elected conveners at Westminster seem to have an enhanced role, at least in the extent that they're more in the public eye and they're therefore more likely to be giving interviews or to be the focus of press attention. So it strikes me that would take up more of an elected convener's time than perhaps is the case um, in most committees at the moment. So I, I, I just think that there, there is a dynamic there that, that might be quite difficult for us in a parliament of this size to accommodate just simply because of the numbers. I have to qualify perhaps what I've said in that I think what I think what the election of chairs in Westminster has done has has been to deliver some slightly different results. Um, there were certainly though chairs who, when appointed, um, already had a high media profile and sought to develop that, and that's been very much. Um, question of the style of the committee chair rather than the a function of the um, the way in which they've been elected. I think the the mandate of having been elected has allowed those who have wished to to exploit um, the, the media platform it gives them to a greater extent but there were already, and I'm thinking for example of, of Keith Faz, the, the chair of the Home Affairs Committee who was a, an appointed chair and then became an elected chair um, and he certainly was, was already a high profile media figure before he became elected. So I'm not sure that makes the difference, I, but that's not quite the point you're making, is, is the point about sort of the capacity of, of, of members. And, it, and if I may just say that clearly I think Parliament would have an issue with someone trying to be both a front bench spokesperson and a committee convener, yeah. you know, because that would clearly defeat the purpose of having elected conveners. So we, we would have this um, difficulty because um, almost since day one we have had collections of MP, MSPs not necessarily affiliated to a particular party but certainly coming together for the purposes of the Bureau's numbers um, who have coalesced into groupings and I, I, I just think that we would we would have to think again about that entire system really. Can, can I just say Sorry. We're just slightly over halfway through Sorry. this session just for timing purposes so Chris answers please. Professor Thank you. Jeffrey. Just, just very briefly I mean, that, that's partly a question about the allocation key um, for, for the, for the distribution of committee conveniorships to, to parties. But on, I'm thinking about the other aspect of, of your question, whether this would get, get in the way of front bench duties. Perhaps this for a small party, um, the Lib Dems now, or in earlier parliaments, the Greens with five or six in the second one, SSP as well, having uh, the platform of a committee convenership might well be seen as far more attractive uh, for the party as well as the individual than being a a front bench spokesperson on a on a on a range of uh, of policy fields. This might be a different way uh, of carrying through the parliamentary role that could be especially valuable uh, for small parties, giving them profile they might not otherwise actually have. Yeah. Let me bring Gill in before I move on to Dave. This comes very much. A substantive uh, point I wanted to make has past been covered, so I would like to just engage in that. 
and, and not take another question. Right, uh, we'll, okay. come, we'll come but, to you later. Sure. Well, no, I, I wouldn't mind taking it just nope. now. Okay. Go on. Uh, and, and it's follow on what George ah. had said, because here we are in this you know, very short history of a parliament that we've had almost everything but revolution uh, delivered to us. I mean, we really have. I don't think there can't be any other parliament that's had in such a short time had all this experience. But it's always been based on a principle of proportionality. So how would proportionality go out the window? Or uh, if it doesn't, effectively, the parties would still need to uh, present the, 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 the candidates, I would assume, it, because it would be based on the, the proportion of the parliament. I, th I think... If you follow what I mean. Hannah knows more about how, how the system works in, in Westminster. So the proportionality system has, has remained the same in, in Westminster. So the allocation between parties, according to the balance of, of those parties in the House, has, has stayed the same. Um, so so, so that, is, that is not a um, difference. Except for this, that if what you were saying earlier on, uh, the influence of the whips, the fact that the, you know, everything's... Sure. The, the Scotland Act dictates everything is governed. Uh, by a proportionate system. So therefore, at the present time, the SNP have got the majority, so they get the majority of people who are likely to be on any list for sure. member, uh, to be a, a convener. W would that so, not be right? So there is so, certainly a question over whether if party discipline within a parliament is very strong, um, then if um, a chair for example, um, was allocated to the SNP and a, a number of SNP candidates wish, wish to stand for that chair, the whips would still make it perfectly clear to the, to the rest of um, the members who the preferred candidate was and that candidate might still be elected. So there is a question over whether you could, in, in a parliament where party discipline is strong, the introduction of elections might not initially have a very great impact. What I think one of the important aspects of the system in Westminster here is that it is a secret ballot um, and that therefore if members feel strongly about who they wish um, to be chair of a committee and are not, um, uh, don't wish to, to follow the recommendation of their whip, um, which I feel sure is, may still be there in certain circumstances, then, then they don't wish to do so. And I think you can probably see the fact that, 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 that the whips influence has reduced in Westminster over who gets to be chair of a committee um, by the fact that there are rumours that um, the, the whips would like to return to a system where um, the, uh, committee chairs were elected from only within an electorate of their own party rather than across the whole house. So they, there's obviously a sense in which the, the grip of the whips has been loosened and therefore um, there is it is more Parliament expressing a view on who should be chair of a committee rather than, than party whips. Is, is that evidence, therefore, in your view, that the reforms are working? Uh, it depends what you mean by working. Explaining <laughs> it's working. Yeah. Yeah. That's, what I, that's what I was creating the opportunity for you to say, rather than saying it myself. <laughs> yeah, go on. So what, what you're proposing is no party influence at all in the allocation. None at all. So the allocation, yes, allocation. Is, is done in the same way as now. Right. As now. The, the, the number of chairs for each um, party is done um, by a, a formula, as, as, as Charlie's been saying. And then, well, then what happens in Westminster is, is the, the, the parties, the whips, decide who gets which committee, which party gets which committee. But then within the electorate, within the the ballot for who becomes the actual chair with it from within that party, that should be a secret ballot and that should be up to the whole parliament to decide from amongst the candidates who who becomes chair. That's fine. Thank you very much, Camilla. Thank you. Yes, Margaret, go on. on yeah, um, just for clarification, in Westminster, ministers, uh, do, you, they're not part of the, uh, you know, they can't vote. There is a convention that um, ministers and PPSs um, for the, of the department for the committee which is being in question, so Department of Health ministers wouldn't vote in the election for the chair of the health committee. But right. otherwise, everyone, everyone votes. Right, because I'm just thinking about, you know, in 
the situation that we have at the moment where there's a huge majority. So, um, it's not a huge majority. <laughs> it feels like a huge majority. <laughs> <laughs> it's a huge plurality. <laughs> but, you know, um, so I thought ministers were excluded, so it's only the ministers of the committees which are up for ballot. Yeah. Only yeah. don't. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> well, it would mean the ministers could certainly vote for this committee because it's not a party committee yeah. in that sense. Can yes, Cameron. When you're saying uh, if a, 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 a convener of a minor party is selected, does that mean somebody else from that party, like the Conservatives, you know, could, if I were by chance convener here, could somebody else from the Conservatives stand or would it only be one person because of the De Haunt system? So the De Haunt system mm. would say um, yeah. there are... You know, um, ten, 10 conveners will be from the SNP and, you know, so and so. And the whips would decide that the chair of this committee was going to be a Conservative chair, say. Um, and then it would be up to all the Conservative members to decide if they wanted to stand for this For the committee. committee. Right, okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, David. Thank you, Conveners. Most of the points I was going to raise have now been raised, but, <coughs> but uh, I'd, I'd like to just tease this out a little bit further because it's very interesting, I think, and uh, going back to comments about independent-minded <coughs> MSPs who might feel they're never going to be ministers who would enjoy chairing a, a, a committee, um, and the, the issue of, of the whips, parties, preferred candidates, and so on. I found it very interesting that Bruce Crawford made a short submission to us. And um, in that, now Bruce was a previous business manager in charge of the, the whips. He was, in essence, a chief whip, I suppose. And uh, he made the point, you know, that parties will play games, I think was the term he used, um, in, in relation to these matters. And therefore, and with his experience, he actually came out in principle in favour of. Um, independently elected whips and I thought that was uh, quite revealing coming uh, from Bruce um, because there's no doubt that power generally likes to retain power and therefore the system really has to allow counter power if you like if it's going to be really effective because it's just in the nature of things that any government is going to try to keep things as tight as it can. Um, so the secret ballot, I think, would be very important because if you had this without a secret ballot, then the power of the whips would be retained. So I'm seeing you all... This is acquiring the nature of a statement. Perhaps you might come to a question. Well, it's, it's, it's probably had to, given what was said before, <laughs> um, in terms of the different points. But I just wanted to make that point in particular, that Bruce Crawford has actually uh, come out in favour of this in principle. I saw the panel nodding their heads there that if this is going to happen, it would need to be done on the basis of a secret ballot. So, that's an important element. Yeah, fine. Well, I, I suppose one of the questions that comes out of the secret ballot, which a number of members have informally expressed to me as convener, is when is the right time to have it? Because if you have it, I mean, the, I, I think the House of Commons is 80 members are retiring or thereabouts this time. So it would be a fair intake. Last time for us, I think the intake proportionally was even greater. Would the electorate know those for whom they might be voting as conveners, their strengths, their weaknesses, their capabilities, is, is one of the questions. If it's done, as it, I guess, has to be relatively early, what are the snags associated with that? Professor Jeffrey, you're dying to come in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think you have to do it at the start of the Parliament. Um, th th there's no, no other real uh, logic, I think. Um, I, I, don't, I don't imagine that new members uh, are unable to inform themselves, uh, and I'm sure the whips would try to do some of the informing uh, for them. Um, but I think the point of having a slate of candidates um, who want to get elected to the post is that they will also be doing some informing, uh, and through whichever kinds of statement or 
uh, whichever conversations uh, in in the in the bar downstairs or however it happens would be uh, seeking support for their election uh, and that would be a communication mechanism for the skills they think they have for, for the role that, <coughs> that <coughs> excuse me that presumably would therefore imply we have a secret ballot for our presiding officers deputy presiding officers but in fact the nominations are known one hour before the vote if I recall correctly. No, nobody's disagreeing with me, so I must be right. Um, I, I take it, therefore, that we'd, we would need to know who is up for election sufficiently far in advance of the election to allow the process of individual members examining and interrogating and sidling up in the bar and so on and so forth. So there'd be some changes in that area. I, will I bring Jim Mitchell in? And I, I mean, I'd just like to think... I would like to think that all elected members are capable of doing the work and doing research and finding out about the colleagues uh, before they make a choice. I'd like to think they would do that on every vote that they participate in. I would also suggest that I think a new member hasn't appeared from outer space. That new member has probably been active in politics and will know not only his or her colleagues in the party, but will know many others, the strengths and weaknesses. It's also worth noting that when it comes to conveners, uh, the World Bank research outlined the kind of key characteristics they felt were important in any convener. These are certainly characteristics that can develop during a parliamentary career, but equally will have developed in many aspects of life before entry into, into Parliament or indeed into politics. Um, I suspect that many conveners and many members have enormous skills um, well before they, they enter the door of this institution. So I, I'm, I'm perhaps, I've got a higher opinion perhaps of, of members of this Parliament than the questioner. Um, if I could excuse the, my, my, my joke there then. We shall treasure your input from here <laughs> on. Uh, David, anything more? No, that's fine. Now, Patricia, that right. do you have any further points? Um, I'd like, if I may, to talk a little bit about the process that might develop. And we've heard that uh, ministers have a, I presume it's a sort of self-denying ordinance that they do not become involved in the vote for the committee that scrutinises them. But I wonder whether in a parliament of this size it would be more sensible to have a, a rule rather than a, a self-regarding self mechanism uh, that said that ministers do not take part in the election of committee conveners. I'm conscious that ministers can find themselves appearing before a number of committees. I was for a time Minister for Tourism, Culture and Sport um, and International Development and a few other things that were thrown in over the piece. Um, and I could find myself at any one of, of perhaps four committees. Um, so would it not just be easier to say that ministers did not take part in the election of conveners? I, I think that's a very fair point about, about an important difference between the relationship of Parliament and government here as compared to Westminster where the, the select committees are designed uh, directly to mirror uh, departments. Here we've moved away from the idea of a department, um, so that simply doesn't work as well. So what you say may have um, quite some merit. Mm. Okay. Um, um, we've heard that you think there should be a secret ballot. I have to say that my experience of secret ballots here does not bear out the view that whips would not be involved in that. Um, um, and I, I say that as someone who was also Minister for Parliament for some time um, and who didn't try to influence secret ballots, I have to say. Um, but that seems to have changed. Um, but I wonder whether you think that the nominations should come from the individual's own party or whether they should come uh, from uh, anyone. I was struck by the fact that it seemed to me that the system at Westminster, at least to read about, sounds quite complicated. In practice, these things tend to be what you know and what you understand anyway. But I, I would have thought we would have wanted to make the system very uh, simple to understand and open and transparent. <coughs> so I, I wondered if you'd given any thought as to how that should be done? Should it be their own party or should it be cross, a, a certain amount of cross-party support that would have to be achieved before you could stand, for example? The, the system in Westminster 
um, on this point isn't very complicated. It's that you should be able to show that um, either 15 members of your own party or 10%, whichever is the lower, support you. And then you can show that um, up to five other members of other parties also support you, and that goes down on your nomination papers, so other members can take that into account. Um, but that's something which ha would have to be tailored to the to the circumstances here, I think. I think it's, it's useful to show you have a minimum level of support from your own party, um, and also interesting to members to see what other support you might have. Lovely example in the Spice paper about the Defence Committee Chair election, and, and there are two, four, six, eight, eight Conservatives um, who nominated themselves. And I'm pretty sure that one of those, or two of them perhaps, were encouraged uh, to do so by their whips. Um, but I don't think the winner was. Interestingly, the winner was the only member who was not already a member of the committee, I believe. That is interesting. <laughs> I think the key point Number is that points. the Whips will try to intervene and will intervene, and that's understandable and even almost, I think it's even acceptable, but this minimises the influence, that's all. I mean, it won't overcome the problem, so I think you're absolutely right, you will still have that, that influence. I also think that um, the breadth of support is important in terms of the nominations, so it would be best if it was the case that a member is nominated by more than her own party. I think that would again encourage yeah. that the, the kind yeah. of independence and, and um, the likelihood of uh, a convener seeking consensus across parties. So I do think that's a very important point. Mm. There is of course the possibility that support from one's own party might actually be the, the killer. <laughs> indeed, indeed, indeed. In terms of what other, how other people perceive you and, and, and think of you. So I wonder then um, whether you think it should be just a, a simple majority vote for, for each of these positions or should it be um, done on a proportional basis as the Parliament is proportional? Um, just interested to know your views if you've thought to that, that, that far forward. So there's an alternative vote system... Um, and then a simple majority. So um, that's just designed to avoid having to have a series of ballots that you can just um, do it in, in one go, basically. So, so sorry, I, I missed the sorry, so it, It's an alternative vote. Just a simple, uh, a simple yeah. majority, yeah. Right, OK. okay. I mean, in as much as you're electing one person, it, uh -huh. it couldn't really be proportional in the, the normal sense of that. But the, if you have to have an outcome of one, you could just go for a simple plurality first past the post or yeah. alternate. So you have to have 50% plus one. I mean, I think that's an interesting point. I mean, I, 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 I have been inclined to the alternative vote, but I don't think that would be a killer if it wasn't to go that way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank I, you always very much. I always remember the 1945 election to Westminster for the university seats. The third member elected for the Scottish universities got 4.16% of the poll, which was less than a third of 12.5, and thus he lost his deposit but still got elected. <laughs> However... <laughs> Uh, it, it also happened in one of the English university seats, so it wasn't a uniquely Scottish thing. Um, so you, you, you do get quirky results when you go for different systems, and it perhaps is no surprise the university seats were abolished before the... the but wouldn't apply. Yeah. Right. Uh, George. Yes, you've already touched on this uh, when Dave was asking some questions. Uh, no, no, I'm not having a go, Dave. Uh, it's, uh, but basically... Is there not a case that there would have to be other changes within the Parliament as well? Would we not have to look at, as Dave already said, the, the kind of larger aspects? Because there's already been some questions brought up with the discussion we've had here today. So would it not be a case that for this to work properly, we would have to broaden out the spectrum uh, totally and look at other changes within the Parliament? <coughs> I mean, it, it's my view that any Parliament would... would should constantly be thinking about its own effectiveness and, and 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 what impact the way it is structured and its systems are having on on the outcomes it it, it thinks are desirable. Um, but I think is uh, get that I get that. But what I'm saying is is the fact is this not just like in the last class elected conveners. If there is an issue, should we not be looking at it as a larger scale? I wouldn't I wouldn't call it. I mean I think. I think if the fact of introducing this reform meant that that no that, 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 that the issue of looking at what else might be done would then be closed, then yes, that that wouldn't be desirable. If this was seen, on the other hand, as a first step, 
because the Parliament thought it was important to think about all the, the range of things that might be done, then, then that is a positive, it looks like a positive step forward. I'm not sure it's an last plus, but it could conceivably be a catalyst. It could contribute to um, a next stage. I don't think it would undermine any next stage in any overall view. I, I, I would be very much in favour of a, a review. I think the Parliament has been pretty good at actually uh, looking at itself every periodically. Um, but I think a, a major review and asking itself where we go forward, particularly in like points that Charlie was making earlier with the increasing powers, then I think um, it would be good. But I think the elected conveners would be a catalyst. It would uh, be a good base in which to then look at the broader questions. So I, 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 I don't think the last to pass would be how I would view it. Well, I think the, um, that there are different issues which face the parliament, different challenges. Uh, one of them is whether there is the right balance here between parliament and the executive. Uh, and I think the committee convener uh, issue is is addressed at that. There are other uh, questions, uh, as or perhaps even more important, uh, about the capacity of uh, the Parliament through its current structures uh, to to deal with the issues that face it. Uh, and uh, I, I think the the prospect of additional powers really puts that question into sharp focus. But I think it's a different question. Uh, I think the question about executive Parliament relationship. Uh, will persist through those different capacity challenges. So I think you can separate out different questions uh, and, and uh, not necessarily see uh, elected conveners as, as a sticking plaster, but as one aspect of, uh, of change that might be needed. Thank you for being the only one not to mention the branded name there, <laughs> actually. I just <laughs> forgot myself. Uh, but the capacity issue I take on, uh, but the, the, the whole point is my, my problem is is that when I look at this uh, and in Westminster to a certain degree you can see it you know apart from the odd wild card it's more or less uh, not created that much of a difference and here call me cynical I don't think it would make that much of a difference in the, the makeup of the convenorships uh, within there apart from possibly the odd wild card now uh, so that's why I'm saying is it is it like a sticking plaster you know would we not have to look at something a bit more detailed and more in depth uh, to actually to make that difference that we're uh, that you're, you're all advocating I mean I'm inclined to ag agree with the point um, that Professor Mitchell was making about, about this potentially being a catalyst um, I think that, that what we've seen in Westminster, I mean, certainly if you spoke to um, to some of the, the sort of House authorities, one of the impacts of electing chairs has been a greater demand for resources and for support for committees from those elected chairs because they're trying to do more and to do things differently. Um, and that might be seen as a, as a disadvantage for some, and certainly there are risks um, involved in it in that you potentially create a system where the committee who shouts loudest and wants to do most starts to attract more of the resource and you have to find ways of managing that. But I think that from the point of view of, um, of how I would imagine um, most elected members feel about you know, the role of parliament, it has to be a good thing if, if members are pushing towards doing more and, and trying different things. And that's not just the ones who you might think of as a wild card, I don't think. It's, it's some members who, who might have been elected chairs under the old system, appointed chairs under the old system, but do feel they have a greater legitimacy to, to do more and do differently under this system. So it might, I, I think p perhaps what you're getting at is the first time it happens, the result might not look very different to how it might have looked if, if it had been done ju just as, as the system is now, but at least it creates the conditions in which a different result is possible, um, whereas under the old system a different result is, is never possible. Okay, okay. Margaret? Yes, um, could I uh, just sort of very briefly just ask uh, what the procedure should be oh, to remove an elected uh, convener? I, I, I can't answer. I, I, I did dig into some of the standing orders at, at, of the House of Commons earlier this morning. I didn't get, get into that one. I'm, sh I'm sure there is an example there of how that circumstance is, is handled. Um, 
Uh, and I guess it would probably need to have two dimensions. One is an expression of loss of confidence in the committee. But since um, the, the convener uh, would have been elected by the parliament as a whole, I think then there would be a second stage uh, in which the consent of parliament uh, as a whole was needed uh, to endorse uh, a motion to, to remove. Uh, I, I suspect yeah. that's something yeah. like the standing orders say, but I, yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah, but I think that's right. I think we'd have to involve the, 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 the um, electorate that elected the convener would presumably have to be involved in the deselection or sacking, however you want to put it, of that convener, um, I would imagine. I think it would be democratically acceptable otherwise. Okay. Thank you. Patricia? Yeah, um, I'll come back to my colleague George's point. Uh, and if I could just explore that a little bit more, it strikes me that in terms of committee conveners pushing to do things differently or to do more, that actually at the moment, because of the numbers we have and the time available to us, we can't even do the things that we have the power to do now, like, for example, pass our own legislation as committees. Um, that, I think that's only happened once in the lifetime of the Parliament, that I, certainly once that I can think of. Um, so I'm not sure how much spare you know, capacity there actually is without there being other more fundamental changes. Um, and if we consider that the role of the committee is to scrutinise government and to hold government to account, as is the job of Parliament, um, then is the election of the convener really going to make a big difference in that very important element of the work that we do? Or are there other things that we should be doing that would give um, effect to that in a better way? Which kind of takes me back to George's point. Um, so are we looking at the right thing at the moment or should we be looking at something else like, for example, I don't know, the makeup of the committee or how the committee is formed rather than jumping straight into the election of conveners? It's, it just seems to me to be disconnected from all the other things that we might want to do. Point, very good point. Um, and I think there's a danger that um, elected conveners will be seen or expected to be the answer to all of the, the weaknesses. And that's not going to happen. I think we've got to be clear about this. Um, elected conveners um, are about achieving certain functions, certain improvements, but they can't do everything. And so that's why I think we've got to be very careful not overstate the case for elected conveners. I think there is a, a very powerful case, and the more I've listened to this discussion this morning, the more powerful I think it has become for an, a, an overview of the Parliament. I think you make a really important point about the, the expectations that the committees would be producing legislation. That was there at the outset. It just hasn't happened. I think there's a capacity issue. I think we do need to go back and, and revisit that. It may be that the conclusion is, well, that's not possible, but I do think we should be honest about these things and, and revisit the, the, these matters. We, you know, we have a We've developed and we've had 15 odd years of experience of, of this structure. I think it's, it would be a, a, a good idea. I guess where we possibly have a, a slight disagreement on, uh, is that I, don't, I think that uh, uh, elected conveners would facilitate that process of further deliberation and potential reform. Um, that's the, which I think, if I'm detecting correctly, you, you, you're sceptical of at the very least. Um, but I, I, I think there is um, a very powerful case for, for revisiting in the whole. And I think particularly, in light, as, as Charlie was saying earlier, of, of powers that are coming. Mm. Can, I, can I make one point about, uh, about scrutiny? Um, I think there is a really fundamental point which uh, um, is connected to the capacity and the resourcing issue but, but, but also distinguishes itself. Uh, and that is whether scrutiny is best delivered uh, in a system uh, in which the the party or parties uh, uh, which which form the government determine uh, who a good proportion of the committee conveners are because that's a, a patronage system and it may not allow the sense of of independence that you might wish in certain circumstances to have and the same applies for opposition uh, whips uh, choosing uh, conveners uh, f uh, to, uh, from, from the other parties because oppositions have um, particular priorities uh, in, in opposing governments which may not necessarily be the priorities that a committee should be uh, following in the work that it does. 
So I think detaching the process from the party whips is in and of itself a really good thing to do for those reasons. David. Yes, it, it, it's just to, we've talked about this issue and it's been done on its own. We've talked about a wider review, but I just wonder, maybe you could help the, the committee here, if when you go away you could put your heads together and think that there might be, if we were to move forward in this, just a handful of sort of issues that might need to be linked into it rather than a full review um, of what we do, but a number of issues that might assist and sort of thing that springs to mind, again getting back to the capacity issue, um, could we, for instance, increase the time available to MSPs by not having such big committees and we have a we have seven here but we're right up to i think what's the biggest one just now 11 or 12 11 and um, we could maybe take that back to eight the haunt of course comes into this uh, but that would release the time of some msps so i just wonder if you would like to comment on that and whether you'd be willing to maybe look at some of those issues that would just assist with the capacity difficulties we have Yes, um, and, and I'd add another one as well. And that, that sounds a, a sensible approach that you, you set out, but I, I suspect the, uh, the clerking and the SPICE support side of things may well have to be reconsidered if, if we were in a situation where we were, in a sense, lifting conveners into a different status. They, they might require different levels of, of support from uh, parliamentary officials. These are certainly questions which are still being explored at Westminster and the Liaison Committee there um, published a report just earlier this week in which they were talking about this very question about whether committees were too big, um, there was too much, um, um, not enough time amongst members to, to sit on all the committees that there are and they were talking about the potential of moving to a system where um, rather than having an exact party balance reflected on every committee you would ensure that the party balance was reflected across the committee system as a whole, or at least a certain set of committees, but parties would be able to make their own decisions about which committees it was really crucial to have more or fewer members on. So those are certainly questions which could be looked at. Well, in terms of the process, I think it would be good to, to look at how this should be done. I wouldn't hand it over to academics to come back to you, <laughs> frankly. Um, I, I think there's, a, there's an opportunity for some kind of dialogue, deliberation, um, and that we could certainly help facilitate yeah. that and to draw on, I think, experience elsewhere. And perhaps this, the starting point would be the founding principles and to consider it. I mean, I, I would be nervous about kind of uh, identifying things that we were particularly interested in. I think it's got to draw on your experience and what you think is important, where, the, where things are fitting in. And perhaps that could be done uh, in a safe place, as it were. Um, it's like the Academy of Government, obviously, comes springs to mind. Um, but I think that we, we would certainly, I think, be very happy to, to, to help facilitate that. That's very helpful. That, I've got two <coughs> further bids, which I think probably is going to take us to, to the end. Cameron and then George. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned that you said committee conveners, you're lifting them to a different status. Would that mean, are you talking about, what's your opinion about remunerating them accordingly? <laughs> I think I said that. I didn't, I didn't mean money, although that's part no, of it. No, I realise that, but the, it was part point. of it, isn't it? Um, I, I, I think the, the idea that we should uh, give... Uh, 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 MSPs who become elected committee conveners another 15,000 a year, which I think is the, the case in, in, in the House of Commons, might not find public favour too easily. Uh, the status I meant was the, the legitimacy of being elected by the Parliament as a whole and not selected uh, by whips, which I think gives a, a stronger sense of legitimacy to the Parliament as a whole. I, mean, I have to put on record saying that I think remuneration should be considered, um, but I, I suspect that uh, my view on that is uh, very much a minority view, and I think in the current climate it would be unacceptable. But the reason I, would, I think it's worth considering is because of the symbolism. It's the symbolism, it's not the actual money itself. It's a statement that we take these posts seriously. Um, but I, I acknowledge that there are incredibly powerful arguments against that, and I think in the current climate it would be clearly unacceptable, but I have to admit I am on public record <laughs> favouring it. So. And certainly anecdotally in Westminster um, 
it's the case that people have said that what election has done has been to narrow the gap between opposition chairs and, and government chairs. So where opposition chairs used to be rel relatively weaker and had to always, you know, find um, support within the within their committee and so on to, to get their what they thought was um, the right programme through and, and reports through and so on. Now the fact that those opposition chairs are elected has, has really strengthened them and brought them a bit closer to the position that government chairs were in before. Thank you. Um, uh, Professor Mitchell successfully anticipated George's question and answered it, so we'll move uh, to my thanking you for coming, but giving you that opportunity I adumbrated at the outset uh, to, in 100 words or less, uh, contribute anything you think we, we, we haven't covered that we might usefully be informed by. Does anyone wish to add to the remarks that have been made thus far? Well, this is a pretty good offer, I think, we've made of, uh, to help facilitate any further discussion. Yes, I, I, I think the, the committee is, uh, is, is, is in broad terms uh, quite open to considering uh, further reform. I think finding the appropriate time to do it and what we might focus on, I think, is a, a matter for another day. Uh, but if the Academy for Government is a, a safe haven in which the early stages of discussion could take place, uh, we're very grateful for uh, that offer and will certainly uh, seek, to, uh, seek to come back to you at the appropriate time. So, once again, thank you very much indeed. And uh, I now suspend this uh, meeting while we move into private session. <laughs>